will show you uh, the end-to-end -end machine learning projects. So click on our schedule. And we have um, the Collabed Reloader for you. Start loading up Collab. So here we are. Probably zoom in, zoom out a little. Okay. So what we're going to do is go over it and uh, basically we even a um, a step of the machine learning project and I have summarized the steps here. Uh, step seven and eight going to be on to the slides, um, but we can start by thinking about um, the code for all the setup. So now the first thing you had to do is to import to make sure the Python 2.5 is installed. Uh, typically, if you work on the Google Collab, these should be provided to you already. So this uh, kind of check you don't have to do. Um, some common import that you need to do is to import the first thing in NumPy. Um, so Python library to help you processing um, numbers. And then also OS if you want to do some uh, I.O. Uh, reading and operation. The random C um, is something that uh, you make sure that computer generate the same uh, random uh, sequence so that it keep your code consistent across the run. So here it's use number 42, but hypothetically, theoretically, you can use any number. And then um, you import some of the MATLAB uh, library to plot. So here we use um, the MATPLOT library in the pilot to plot out the figures. Um, do we, we don't also have some uh, a function to um, save the figure into disk. Um, you don't have to do it. In fact, I comment out all of the save figure functionality. Uh, but if you want to save to put in your PowerPoint or somewhere else, you, you actually can do that. So here's some uh, documentation for, for it. And some warning. Uh, don't have to worry about that quite yet. So what I'm gonna happen now is I'm gonna run this block of code and typically what you can do, you either can hit this play button or press shift enter. That will run the, the code for you. So you see that the thing's running and it's ready to go. When it's done running, you can see the number uh, ordered to run at the top left there. So after we set up everything up, now it's about get the data. So to get in data, we need to import a few things. So the IO, uh, import the iOS to, uh, in order to run some of the IO operation. You need to also import tar file. This is support a compressed file. In fact, our data set can be a compressed file. Um, and so we need uh, that to, to unzip it. Also the URL library to support URL download. There are a few variables that you need to set up. Um, so in, you can set up um, these paths, so URL, um, uh, when you have capital variable like this, it means that it is constant. Um, so to make sure it's clear, um, so you, the OS path join gives you give, create a path using different folders names. And this is a zip file that we want to download. Um, this function you don't have to write mostly, you're going to provide it to you. It's basically said that you want to fetch the data into a zip file into your workspace. So um, I go ahead and run that. And then when you call fast housing data, which is this function, you're going to fetch the data into your workspace. After that, you're going to need um, additional um, library called pandas. So the panda is going to enable data manipulation. So uh, I write another function, and you can certainly uh, write some custom function or do this one. It's very simple. The gist of it here is you um, you construct the path or where is the housing uh, store uh, in CSV formats most of the time, and you call a read CSV, passing the path to return the file. So that's the function, and I can um, call it here and pass into housing. So housing right now would contain all of my uh, my, my data set in the housing. So um, you see dot hit function here will show you the first 10 rows of the data. And you don't passing any variable, it would by default show you a uh, first five row. So I run it, you can see here, you have all of the, long, um, the data set show in the table format. And you can see that several 
um, several columns here and also different rows. So you see, it looks like it's a regular table with the um, headers and the index. We can learn that a bit later. This is a format that we use in uh, Pandas uh, data frames. And they're a very useful, readable format that we understand because in table form. You can look around um, using some uh, information uh, function called housing.info. So it's going to give you quick information about the features, the count, and the type. So I'll run that real quick. You can see here, uh, learn more about your data set. It's about 20,000 entries and the different 10 data columns. Um, and the feature is uh, below. So you have longitude, latitude, housing, median A, total room, total bedroom, population, household, median income, median house value, and ocean proximity. Now, most of these um, feature would be a under a float 64, so 64 bit float. Uh, all of them are non null, so that you know that they are um, they have numbers in them. Um, the ocean proximity as an object, because um, this is, as you see up here, it is um, a string instead of a number, so it, um, it won't be a float 64, but rather an object string. If you look down here, this is the number of um, items that in certain features here. And look like they all have 20,640 except total bedroom here. Like it seemed like a bit of missing data. Uh, we're going to look into that in a little bit. And finally, some memory usage and so on. So, giving you an overview summary of the data. Um, if you want to see a certain count or some feature, say the ocean proximity is here, you can use the value count function. Um, from this is part of panda, so housing the panda objects, you can call this function, it's very nice. So you may call count value, are going to give me different value of that ocean proximity. So it will be one hour from the ocean, uh, there will be 9,000 district, England, 65 district near ocean, near bay and island only five. Um, so you can give you a kind of easier look into what the categories and each of uh, the category would have how many, how many uh, items. Um, a little bit more. Uh, if you want to look into some statistics about the data set, you can use the describe function. Uh, describe function right here, and you call housing dot describe. Going to show you the basic statistic about the data set. So things like count, mean, standard deviation, mean twenty five percent, mean fifty percent, mean seventy five percent, mean, and the max. So it'll give you a more basic statistic of all of your features here. That table, and you notice it didn't show the um, the ocean proximity because it is um, the the string and it's not number, so there are not much of the statistics that you can show. Next, you're gonna try to plot out uh, this data set, and the matplotlib uh, library uh, would uh, let you to do this. So the histogram function is really nice; it get you to summarize the data set in a graphical sense, and you can see. Um, how your data layout in different bins. So if you look closely down here, um, this is the household. And uh, look like many of the district here have about uh, 500 households, with many of them have a bit more. So you can see the distributions here. How median's age here, and you can see there is how built across from one new house to really old house, and you notice there is a really spike up in the data, and this gives you some insight. Uh, what happened here is that the houses that built in more fifty years ago get capped at fifty years, so that's why you see the shoot up. But then there be houses that are older than fifty. So there's two spikes here and a little spike, and so you, you can see the this will kind of give you a bit of insight about the economic booms and um, I'm not collapse, but uh, kind of downturn. So you can see it's in, in cycle is how the house will feel. Kind of give you a really nice um, uh, insight about it. Uh, latitude uh, is kind of nice. I think it will give you um, different concentration on where these houses are in California. You concentrate in a few big cities and spread out the rest of them. 
So each of these features are going to give you something to think about and usually plan about, give you, get you more insight about the data set. Next, we're going to figure out where we can organize this data set into training set, test sets, and so on. So um, we're going to try to implement that into our functions um, called uh, split train tests to pass in the data and the test ratio. And first thing you're going to do, we're going to try to shuffle the index. The index will basically give you uh, each of the row in your data is having an index. So if you want to shuffle that so you can sort of randomize your your the row in your data set without uh, keeping the uh, columns uh, sorted out. Um, so you figured out how much the size of your test set um, based on the split ratio here. And then you would um, have um, the uh, construction of the test index and the train index. And then you split the data using the I lock. So I location is basically the index location of your data and so on. So you pass in the data, which is going to be passing the housing. Um, this can get uh, under index. So this is going to split into train data and that can split into test data. So go ahead and run that. And if I call split train test passing housing uh, split ratio at point 0.2, so 20% be testing and 80% um, be training, and you return train set and the test set. And from there, you can use the len function to see how um, the dimensionality of the uh, train set here. Again, you, you can use something different as well. So instead of you len, I can do print uh, train set that shape, you're going to accomplish similar thing. But the shape also give me the dimension of the data, which in this case, 10 dimension and the, the length about the same. So same thing with the test set. So I have about 16,000 um, row to train and about 4,000 to test. Okay. Other thing you can do is the head function. Again, you can want to just sneak peek at the uh, test data, see what it looks like. So we just wrote a function about the train test split, but uh, scikit-learn actually provide that functionality for you, so you don't have to write it yourself, even though we just kind of did. Um, same thing here. Um, you can just split it using the test side ratio. Now, uh, furthermore, on the future exploration, you can see the median incomes here. Um, and you notice this is um, it's in the numbers here. So. Um, based on the team that collect them data um, they basically these each of these number represent uh, ten of thousands of dollars so four mean forty thousand six mean sixty thousand and so on um, so sometimes you, you you will have some question about the data and depend on you know, the context of the problem and how the data collected um, the data maybe represent uh, a different uh, compare um, to what you would commonly see in the in the actual value, so here instead of forty thousand, it's twenty four, and different feature might have different unit here as well. So you notice that the the income here is uh, pretty tail heavy, which means that um, there are many many income bracket later on. So what you want to do is that you want to create a sort of uh, data so that this will look um, like a normal distribution. And you can do that um, by uh, transform this housing into a different uh, bit. And you can do that using uh, panda cut function. So this cut function is really nice. You're passing the housing uh, feature median income. By the way, the square bracket is for um, you want to specify a certain column in your data set. So this here, we look in that median income column. And you specify the bin. So the here you specify five bin. The first one from 0 to 1.5, second one point point five to 3, so on and so forth. And then you label it at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we, in a way, relabel the data. Instead of many, many different bins here, we're going to just put in five bin and make sure they're more uh, normally distributed. Uh, so if you run that, you're going to have an income category, which is a, di a new columns in there. And here is the value. Um, you notice that they, they're no longer uh, tail heavy. 
pity. pity uh, and it looked like it's become a more normal distribution. Right? So, so, so far, um, we have only looked at uh, random sampling method when we shuffle the data set to split and train and test. Um, sometimes, it's, if the data is small enough, it's not a big deal. Uh, well, actually, when the data is large, it's not a big deal. But when the data uh, is smaller, you might run into some significant bias. So a, a better strategy um, would be stratify um, sampling. So uh, the, the way stratify sampling works is to make sure that the, the sample are representative of the whole population. So the example here, if the US population have 51.3 female and 48.7 male, then when we conduct a survey in the US, we want to make sure the ratio for the example. So in this case, you're going to have a, a 500, and you're going to collect a thousand people, and then make sure that 513 female and 487 male. And you can use that in um, scikit-learn with stratify, suffer, split. This split will make sure the ratio um, of, of the, the data um, remain when it comes to the um, income categories. So let's take a look. And we run it. And you say, OK, I'm going to count all the value in my test set. So it looked like uh, category 3, 35% to 31, and so on. And if I run it in my, in my entire data set, uh, what's incredible is that uh, the ratios stay the same. So this this is a stratify sampling. So you can see your uh, training sample remain, remain the same. Um, proportional, um, this is, you don't have to worry about this right now. This basically to construct a table so you can see the difference between random and stratify sampling. It's not really part of um, your, your, uh, your project. And finally, um, we just want to show you uh, the stratified income, so uh, we're not going to use it by your data set. So you can go ahead and drop it. So that was that was your step two, processing uh, the data. I know it's quite long, but all of them is about um, processing your data. Next, we're gonna um, some trying to visualize the data, hopefully gain some same insight, and also look in some you know see if we can discover anything else from the data set. So step three. All right. So um, we're going to make a copy of a stratified train set. Um, this is going to be our train set, but we're going to call it housing, so it's very easier. Um, so we can only look in that train set for now. So I'll make a copy of my stratified uh, train set. Uh, keep in mind that we don't ever look at the test sets until we finish building the model. And that keep it your uh, model is objective. You're not, you can't really peek at the test set, any insight that you get from the test set. Uh, may be very biased and consider a bit of a cheating. If you truly want to evaluate your model, you should tip, keep the test set separate and only use it when um, you finish building the model. And that, at the end, we'll do that. So next, I'm going to try to visualize uh, my income uh, uh, housing uh, across California. So if you use the plot function, and this is scatter plot. And with respect to longitude and latitude, um, you're going to arise some map like this. So this is all the district housing in California. And you can see, oh, yeah, it kind of look like California. Uh, most of the time, I can't see anything very well. It looks like a very dense thing, uh, population here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a, a transparent channel to the plot. And I'm going to base on um, alpha about 10%. Um, so it's going to get each of the plot only a transparency of 10%. So you can see where the points are concentrated and where the points are not as concentrated. So if you plot it, it's going to look like that. And you can see here concentration, several probably big city, and then everything else kind of uh, very light. Okay. And then next is like, well, uh, this, each of these districts have different size. And I want to be able to not only represent the side, but also see how expensive each of the housing is. So in order to do that, we're going to specify a few more things. So beside the alpha, 
you're gonna also do um, the size based on the population. So uh, you size the the plot based on the uh, population divided by hundred. And then also I'm gonna use um, colored to label each of these circle. And I'm gonna use the how value for the circle. Right, so how value um, C map is the a color map that I'm going to use. And jet is so it look like a rainbow. Um, so basically, higher number, how value is going to be more red, lower value is going to be more blue. And it's going to show the yeah, color bar, so you know. Uh, well, with the uh, Sarah X here, I'm um, just trying to fix a bug, so you don't have to worry about that. So let's plot. Here we are. We arrived at something very nice as far as visualization to see the different housing market in California. And it's gonna give you a lot of insight. You can see, oh yeah, um, in sort of a patch, it's like a, England, um, the housing value gonna be lower and it's kind of distributed across um, this line. Um, I think that's along the highway. And then in the coast, you can see houses are uh, more expensive and you can see some really red one um, here, here, and maybe here to a cluster. You probably know what city that is. Um, if not, we're gonna figure out a way you can uh, see that in the map, right? So this, this could help you plot in the map. So you're gonna incorporate a map in and a map is nothing but an image. You're gonna overlay the map with with the data that you have so far and so this code allow you to also incorporate the map so let me run it oh so i run into some errors um you can try to debug sometime um this you know happen probably a lot when you're trying to run your code so um see so what happened here is the image i'm missing um, so what happened in, in Collab, you can uh, upload the file. So the image may be missing from image and to end project. Right, so I'm gonna wanna upload the image here so we can read. I can upload it. I think I may have an image somewhere in here. Okay, good. That's the image of California map. I can upload it. Yeah, I say that after you I lock off, you're gonna get deleted. Apparently Google didn't want to store uh, your image this way, but it's good for now. I can run it again and voila, now I have a really nice map that I can show uh, even some real estate agent and they're probably really appreciative of this map, right? You can see the trend and everything. Um, if you zoom in the map really big, you might see a lot more detail, but this is give us very big, big picture idea. Another thing you can do is that the uh, correlation of, of the data set. So you, if you want to look into see how the feature are interact to each other and correlation is an excellent way um, for you to do that. So the uh, correlation or standard correlation coefficient, uh, the Pearson R is is value from like one to one. And when it, things are close to one, um, they are very strong positive correlate to each other. And things are called positive correlated when they go in up and down together. So how, so for example, median value trying to go up where median income goes up, for example. Right, you might have um, not a strong correlation. Zero would be no correlation at all. <laughs> and so kind of a uh, random. And negative, it's gonna be into the negative correlation. Right, so this show you some of the uh, nice uh, visualization about how the point would plot in the 2D plane if uh, their correlation is certain numbers here. Right? Um, if you have some distribution like this, uh, typically there's no really any correlation at all. Remember this is also a linear correlated, right? So so um, keep that in mind. So these are not linear line, it didn't form a line, so that'll be zero. These form a line, so it doesn't matter what uh, slope they have here, they all gonna be uh, positive correlation and negative correlation. Okay, um, so if I run correlations on my housing data set 
and I want to see, so that's going to result in the 9 by 9 matrix because that's each of the features going to be correlated to others, um, to the rest of the features, so uh, including itself in there, right? Um, so if you look at median house value and see what they correlated, you can sort it by um, value, so you see the strongest uh, correlated displays first. Let's see. Oh, I think I have to run this one. Okay. Now I can run that. Right. So, median values value correlate one to itself because every everything is very much strongly correlated to itself. Uh, but uh, the next thing is going to be more uh, things to look at. So you can see correlate very strong correlation with median income, right? Sixty-eight point sixty-eight. Total room about thirteen. So you can see the big drop off here. How median age, the age of the house, about eleven point eleven household, point oh six. Members have households here because this is basically the size of your district. So there's some correlation, but uh, not very strong. So on and so forth. There's some also negative correlations uh, to longitude, latitude, uh, latitude, uh, definitely negative numbers. Okay, so that give us some rough idea, uh, but you're going to have to look deeper into it. Uh, one thing you can do, you can plot. You can try plot these uh, matrices. It'll take a while to plot for that, but there's several plots here. And kind of give you, okay, um, this is from median half value and median income. And you can see there is kind of cluster in there, sort of a line, even though it's, you know, it's, it's, it gives you some pattern, but um, not a whole lot. But you can see there's certainly some patterns here compared to, say, this. Right, that, not much going on there. Um, so I'm going to look, zoom this a bit larger, and I can have its own plot. Okay, and you can use the scatter plot function with the x is median income and the y is house value to see the difference. So there's a few things striking from this plot. One is you can see there is a line here. And the reason is uh, I think they cap the, the house and uh, value at 500000 And there's more house that's more expensive than that. But for the purpose of data, they cap it at 500000 That's one you see it kind of across there. Yeah, you see some correlation. Um, so the next thing is that you want to see if anything else you can do as far as the features to make it stronger, and the uh, feature engineering help you to do that. So you basically want to create new features from existing one. Right? For example, I'm going to create the feature room plus household, and, re and one way I can do that is to take the total room and divide by the number of households. Right, so um, the way the data organized, it, it added up all the number of rooms there, and it also had number of households. So by itself, the total number of room height, it maybe just means they have a lot of household. So you want to normalize it, right? So um, you, you would have divided by numbers household. So you create a new feature that way. You can also create a number of bedroom per room. So take number of bedroom, divide number of room. Population plus household, so you see how many people live in each household. Population divided by household. So you do that, um, you can have more features. So before you have ten features, now you have thirteen. Can you just add three? And then you can look at some correlation again, uh, really nicely. Um, so the the new feature that we create, the room plus household, actually make a big difference. You can see a room plus household correlation of fourteen percent more than any other features here beside median income. But you know, median income is a main indicators here. So it's so some insight about housing there. Again, you can plot it out. Um, it's not very clear uh, how correlated it is, but it's something. Right, so you have the bedroom population, and now you have room plus household, and so on and so forth. So, um, it's the first one here, the count. So, uh, Great. So that's some of the insight that you can gain from from having uh, these uh, visualizations. Right. Next, we're gonna look in how we can clean the data, aka data cleaning. And this step takes majority of time from a computer scientist. Uh, data never really clean, and sometimes it has been cleaned for you for the purpose of education. But real world data is rather messy and. Uh, if you have a data scientific position, this is one of the things you want to spend your time a lot. Like we discussed last time with the Tesla 
AI director. Uh, most of the time we just spend on working with the data. So how you clean the data. So say that you have a train for data, you're gonna split it into the feature and the label. So we decide to use the label at the median house value because that's what we want to um, to 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 predict and eventually, right? And predict. So you want to put it at the label because that's gonna serve at our um, training. So you split the data into the feature, which is you drop the median house value from the set, and then have it at its own. Uh, Valuable, right? So you have housing features and housing labels here. Okay. First thing you need to check uh, in your data is see whether it is contains some um, empty slot or null value or not a number or so. So um, you can check it by the function is null, right? So is null, and you can say, okay, I'm gonna see if it's contained in any of my features here. We'll see how many null uh, there. It look like they have about five um, row that have a, not a number for a total better. They didn't know. They didn't report. And this happened a lot in real world, right? Collect data. Some data is missing. People not answer the phone call. Um, people didn't know via survey or didn't complete the survey. That sort of thing. You're gonna have some uh, empty, empty things your table. So there's several strategies that you can do for this. Um, First strategy, you can just say, well, if I collect the data, and presumably you have a lot of data, is that you have a lot of data, you can say, well, I don't need these row, so what I can do is I can remove it. So I can remove the row that have contains uh, missing data. Right? You can drop, so you can say drop NA here, uh, um, to, 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 to drop the missing value. So there you go. If you dropped it, it's no longer contained. Any, any, uh. A second option it would be you would uh, drop the feature altogether. If the feature contains too many missing value and you didn't think that was useful, you can decide to drop the entire features. Even though that's a bit risky, because you know you might spend a lot of time collecting the feature, for example. But so again, you're gonna drop the total number of bedroom. Now your data is clean. The third thing, which what would be recommended, is trying to fill the missing value with some reasonable value. It's zero would be the mean, fill it with the median, right? So you can do, you can calculate the median of the total bedroom, and then fill the missing value with the median value. Right? Okay. Now, if you look at the complete rows again, ah. Uh, where is the total number of bedroom here? Can be filled with the median value of four hundred and thirty-three. So it's better, even though it's kind of weird. They all have the same value. The best we can do, right? Um, Scikit Learn have a handy class that uh, handle um, this issue called the Simple Imputer. So you can create an imputer sub object and passing strategy of median, and then you can use. Uh, that imputer a little bit here. So um, the imputer only work on the numerical attribute. So I had to drop the ocean proximities to not to use it. So I have a housing numeric value only here. And then I can use the fit function to fit the imputer with median strategy into my housing um, numeric value. And that's all. It will give. It will fill the um, the missing value for you. Using the strategy, so that kind of neat. Um, so if you look in at that, um, some statistics from uh, median, uh, you can see they are basically the same. So it's just calculate your median, and then after you fit, the another function you had to do is called transform. So you're gonna see this uh, quite a few times in Scikit Learn is um, that you want to transform the data set. First, you have to figure out a way to 
learn the parameters of it called fit function, and then you would transform the data uh, under the transform function. So here, I learned the fit already, right? and then next I'm going to transform. So I say imputer transform, passing value, and then return x. So x is a new value for housing number. It's going up a little bit. Run it. So that is your x. Now you notice x now is in a uh, NumPy array, which is uh, not what we used to look at. We like to look at a table format with the headers and the indexing. So um, you can you can uh, you can convert this matrix into the data frames again with contain headers and index. So you can do that using the panda dot data frame method and passing the NumPy array. And the column is the uh, number of columns in your housing data set. So housing num columns. And the index is housing index. So it's kind of the same, but you had to do it um, so that you can see uh, that your housing now is equipped with um, headers and index again. Just again, so median. So, so far we have been able to fill all the value within our uh, numerical value. Well, what about um, categories? The categories is important, so you need to figure out a way to um, encode your categories. So it, right now, um, it's not in numerical value, which can be an issue to, for machine learning to learn, especially for statistical method. Um, it seems to do much better with um, numbers. So if we look at our uh, string categories here, uh, these are the feature of these are the row index. So one way you can do it due to, to encode using consecutive for each of the category, right? So I can have different category. I'm going to just slam a num numerical category for each of these. Um, so that sounds like, OK, fine, I'm going to do Less than an hour in the ocean, number zero, near ocean, number one, England, number two, and so on and so forth. So I will have five different, five, four different categories. And that's when we do encode it. You say, yeah, that sounds good. Why not? Right? So zero to four. And you can look at the categories here. Um, so we kind of keep track of the order, right? So the less than one hour ocean would be zero, England would be one, and so on. So one issue with this is that uh, in, um, in 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 the, some algorithm in machine learning, we assume that two nearby value um, the the same thing as the distant value. So you would think in this case, um, the the one less one hour in the ocean and the England will be a lot closer than one hour uh, one hour less than ocean and near ocean would be a lot farther. So so the distance in real world did not map to the distance in the categorical numeric uh, categorical value, right? So it worked in some case, like when it's have all the category, like good, bad, average, good, and excellent, but obviously doesn't work for the ocean proximities columns here. So the solution for this is that you use one hot encoder. And one hot encoder is the theme of encoding by converting um, each of the category into a vector called a one hot vector. And the reason it's called one hot because uh, each of the vector is gonna be all zero, which is code except for one value gonna be one, which is hot. And that value will be correspond to the um, categories. Okay. So let me run an example for you. So again, um, you encode it using fit transform, and fit transform basically combine the functionality of the fit and the transform function together, so that you don't have to run it twice. Um, but this is done two things: fit and then transform. So I can convert that. And you, if you want to take a look at it, you can. It kind of look like this, right? So each of the um, column or category can be converted to a vector of five. Remember. So if it is near ocean, the first one will be hot or one, and then the rest will be zero, so on and so forth. And this one will be the last category, the near ocean, and so on. Right? Um, you notice this vector is going to create 
five more column added to my data set. And many of this are going to be zero. So a lot of zero in this uh, matrix. And when you have a lot of zero in matrix, you, can, you call that matrix sparse. And may not be the best thing, so you kind of avoid that. Um, so you can order is it a spar equal fault so it will store the data more efficiently um, but just remember the location of the one instead of saving all the zero so a more detail on that later right. you can also write a um, so far you can use some transformer with fit and transform you actually can also write your own and that's called custom transformer so here i'll show you the code real quick um, on how to write it. Yeah, of course you didn't have to, uh, but eventually you may want to add no new feature and you want to be able to transform your data set into it and you want to have a systematic way to do it. And uh, this provides you a automatic way to do it. And when you implement a um, custom transformer, make sure you um, include these method initializations, fit transform, and, and you implement uh, what you want and that's return with the transformation. And so you can call it uh, right below here. Uh, this code basically um, added a few more uh, features that they need to run. Um, the thing is add three, but then decide to drop one out, so it still is added two. And also another uh, useful data uh, processing is the um, standard scalar. And the, and the reason for this is that um, um, your data come in all kind of scale, right? So the, the value of the how going to be in the hundred thousands of dollars, but then the households numbers household may be in the hundreds, and then the the income category is from one to five. So you can see different value might cause machine learning to put weight differently. So you want to create some sort of standard across the columns in particular, and you want to standardize it. And for that, we're going to use the um, standard scalar, which is another transformer. So. With all that in mind, you need to process your data in certain pipelines so that the order of your data get preserved. And the reason you do this is that uh, sometimes you got new data comes in and you want to process it exactly the same way you process with your old data. And uh, you have a tool called the pipeline to help you to do that very, uh, very easily. So the, you can set up the pipeline here. I'm using um, a pipeline method uh, a class from the scikit-learn and the pipeline you set up three steps here so first I'm gonna do my imputer to fill out any missing value and then I'll add a few more features and then I try to scale all the features so then the three things I want to do with my data I can set the pipeline and you can reuse this pipeline again and again um, for other new data set that comes in you go through the same transformation so my try number pipeline you the fit transform method and passing housing you're gonna get the clean data from the housing um, transform again I want to show you the data oh, obviously I had to run this then yeah there you go um, so we, we got the um, processing of the number numerical and the categorical column separately now we need to combine together. And um, the way we do that, we're using the column transformers. And the column transformer is simply to put together um, the numerical pipeline and then the one hot encoder, which is what we use for the categories. So put them together. And now here I'll show you the shape. Um, housing prepare is the result of our processing. So this is when we clean up the data and everything, put them all back together. And you can see they have more features <laughs> than the housing, uh, original housing. So I only have nine features in original housing because we take out the, we have 10 originally, we take out the um, minimum value. So we only have nine left. We added five more. Uh, oh, seven more, I'm sorry. So five from the categorical value and two is the additional features. So here we go. So that's it for the data processing, which which is a, a complicated, long, long steps. And uh, yeah, they, it more depend on the data that you have. Some data is clean, so you don't have to do as much. But some data may not be too clean, which in which case you have to, to, to do a lot. Next step is to select and train a model. This is when you st 